please welcome back to the podium, Jacqueline Alder. Great. Um, thanks everyone for coming back after the break. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to you our next panel. We have with us Nancy Rabelis of the Louisiana University's Marine Consortium, Daniel Conley of Lund University, Kristen Davon of the Government of St. Lucia, and Carrie Neildfett Thomas of the Mosaic Company. This group of panelists will also be presenting the science, the problems, and solutions surrounding nutrient pollution of the marine environment. We are going to hear about the biggest dead zones that exist in the world's oceans today and how they, can, how they came to be. We're also going to hear about some of the ways that countries are working to stop these dead zones from forming and the solutions that private companies in the fertilizer industry are implementing to help solve this challenge. Starting with the state of the science, our first presenter is Nancy Rabelis, Executive Director and Professor of the Louisiana University's Marine Consortium and le a leader in the scientific efforts to understand how nutrients impact the marine environment. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here today. We did hear early this morning from Secretary Kerry at least twice, maybe three times, about dead zones. So I'm going to talk about the scientific word of dead zone, which is coastal hypoxia, which sounds like a disease, and it is, because if you can't breathe, nothing else matters. And there are areas in the ocean where the oxygen is devoid on the bottom, and the fish and shrimp and crabs that depend on that oxygen have to flee the area, and others will die if they can't move out of the area. There is a map with red dots all over the place. Uh, don't be concerned. If your coastal ocean doesn't have a red dot right now, it will someday because of the activities of human beings that are putting too many molecules of nitrogen and phosphorus into the oceans that are leading to major algal blooms that sink to the bottom where they're decomposed and the oxygen is depleted. The U.S. has its share. The red dots show where it has been documented. The yellow dots where the conditions are likely. And the green dots, either no data or data that shows no hypoxia. And if you notice the red dot at the bottom of the Mississippi River out in the Gulf of Mexico, that's the uh, dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico affected by that river. And as mentioned in the marine debris uh, discussion, what happens far away from these coastal zones affects what we're seeing today. My friends in Mexico are beginning to get their dead zones. I'm working with a consortium of Mexican research institutes to help them get started on their work. And I gave a talk in uh, Bahia Blanca, Argentina in 1999 when the only red dot on the map was Concepcion, Chile. And you can see now, including the place where I gave my presentation, there are many more dots, and their large rivers are not any more immune than the Mississippi River. The consequences are real, from fish kills to loss of fisheries resources to organisms that have to try to find oxygen and come up out of the sediments to those that eventually die off and decompose and before too long, we have black sediments on the bottom covered by sulfur bacteria. They are not natural. Most of these dead zones have been either aggravated by or caused by human activity. And we know this because we can take sediments from the bottom of the ocean and look at what lives in those sediments and tell whether the system has more productivity or whether animals can't live there anymore. And these little microscopic animals at the bottom of the slide called foraminiferans tell us that in the Gulf of Mexico, hypoxia has not always been a feature, that some of these animals are no longer present, and the only ones that can live now are those that can withstand the low oxygen. This is all due to nutrient pollution, too much nitrogen and phosphorus, which has uh, increased by 300% since the Industrial Revolution. 
and mostly since the 1950s. These nutrients are very important. They support our farm agriculture. I put nutrients on my violet that sits on my kitchen sink window, and other people put fertilizers on their gardens, in their lawns, and in golf courses. It's all designed to grow food, food for ourselves, food to feed livestock, um, to make things that we like to eat. And since I said I work in Mexico a lot, my favorite food is tacos. The drivers are human population. We will reach 9 billion people um, by the year 2050. And with them come more fertilizers and more emissions of nitrous oxides. The largest one in the US and in the coastal oceans, second to one other that you'll hear about, is in the Gulf of Mexico, adjacent to the Mississippi River, which you can see on the side photos. Uh, it's a large area, about the size of New Jersey, sometimes Massachusetts, which would not make Senator or Secretary Kerry very happy, I don't think. And that's an area that does not support thin fish, shrimp, and crabs. It's a complex situation set within a complex combination of multiple stressors. Human beings affect climate. Climate affects water quality. Water quality affects whether low oxygen will occur or not. So it's, it's a complex situation. It um, will continue to grow in our future as we have more and more people, more and more agriculture, more and more wastewater, and uh, changes in climate. The US EPA did a report on the uh, condition of hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico in 2006. It supported the science, and it definitely said that the solution needs to be to reduce both nitrogen and, pol and phosphorus pollution to this area. There are a lot of ways to do this, reduce fertilizers, better farm management, uh, less consumption of fossil fuel, many things that we can do and you can do as an individual um, to make a difference in this area. Thank you very much. Our problem speaker is Daniel Conley, a professor of biogeochemistry at Lund University in Sweden, focusing on human impacts on the marine environment, who will tell us about the impacts of nutrient pollution in the Baltic Sea region. Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, good afternoon. We get many things from the ocean. We get pleasure from recreation. We get food for humanity. However, as Dr. Rabelais said, there's a large growing problem in the oceans, and that's hypoxia, which is the lack of oxygen in bottom waters. I want to talk about the largest human-endosed low oxygen dead zone in the world, the Baltic Sea, which is located in northern Europe. And I'll come back and tell you a little bit more about Olaf Johansson, who's pictured on the wall here. Um, going back to port after a successful day of fishing. Nutrient pollution comes from many sources in many sectors of the economy, from burning fossil fuels to small boats to large cruise boats. And as shown by Dr. Rabelais, it's the excess of two primary nutrient causes the problems of hypoxia. In the Baltic Sea, over 50% of the phosphorus comes from inadequate treatment of wastewater or from poorly functioning household septic systems. We also have a growing problem from, with nitrogen, which comes from agriculture. On average, about a quarter of it comes from large animal farms and a quarter of it comes from fertilizers. Hypoxia in the Baltic Sea occurs in two distinct ways. The first is coastal hypoxia, and that's primary a problem in warmer summer months. We have, a, we have over 600 monitoring sites in coastal areas of the Baltic Sea. Out of those, over 200 show their occurrence of hypoxia in the last decade. You need to keep in mind that the Baltic is one of the most studied areas in the world, so we're fortunate to have enough data to look at trends. Hypoxia occurs and enclosed coastal areas, especially such as the Stockholm Archipelago, which is pictured in the slide. Um, because there's oxygen in bottom water for much of the year, 
when oxygen concentrations decrease during the summer, it's a dramatic change and it kills marine organisms, especially those living on the bottom. Hypoxia also occurs in the deep waters of the Baltic Sea. Today, nearly all areas over 100 meters deep or 300 feet have low oxygen conditions throughout the entire year. Our analysis shows that there are some areas of the Baltic that might be naturally low in oxygen, maybe a few thousand square kilometers. However, hypoxia increased tremendously after World War II with the industrialization of agriculture and with the growing populations in coastal cities. Today, the hypoxic area is over 65,000 square kilometers. That's the size of the states of Maryland and Virginia put together. The consequences of hypoxia has profound social and economic impacts. Hypoxia causes phosphorus to be released from bottom sediments, which comes up into the water column and enhances the growth of a type of algae called cyanobacteria, um, which are better known as blue-green algae, many of which are toxic. Um, and would you like to swim in waters like that? Um, I wouldn't. The second aspect of hypoxia is it's killing fish and reducing areas for spawning. Um, Olaf, who I showed in the first slide, contacted me about three years ago because there were too few fish and he was concerned about problems of coastal hypoxia. Unfortunately, Olaf went out of business two years ago because he was unable to catch enough fish to sell in this store. So we need to cut both nitrogen and phosphorus loads to the oceans. In the Baltic Sea, we've developed an action plan to reduce nutrients that has been agreed upon by all nine countries surrounding the Baltic Sea. One of the keys to the plan is that each country has a different nutrient reduction target, and the targets are fairly shared by all Baltic Sea countries. The solutions to reach the nutrient reduction targets include cutting wastewater inputs and reducing the amount of nutrient losses from agriculture. However, getting to these solutions of the problem will be difficult. We'll hear more about that in the talks following mine. My hope is that in the future, we'll have a healthy, productive, sustainable Baltic Sea that provides abundant recreational opportunities, tourism, and a livelihood for all the 85 million people living around the Baltic Sea. Thank you for listening. Great, thank you, good talk. Our solution speaker starts with Crispin Davin, who serves as Chief Sustainable Development and Environment Officer in St. Lucia's Ministry of Sustainable Development, Energy, Science, and Technology, where he has lead responsibility on ocean governance matters. Welcome, Kristen. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Just in case you're wondering where St. Lucia is, St. Lucia is located in the southeastern chain of the Caribbean archipelago. So we are known as the Helen of the West because St. Lucia was, has historically been known for its, its natural beauty. We have a population of about 170,000 and um, our capital is Castries. We have an area of 238 square miles or 616 square kilometers. One of our claims to fame is that we are the Nobel Laureate capital of the world, we have two, so we have the highest density per square mile. <laughs> so the sources of marine pollution in St. Lucia include liquid waste from outdated or inadequate municipal treatment systems, outdated or malfunctioning domestic septic tanks, because a lot of our individual houses are connected to septic tanks, sediment transport from rivers, especially during, hurricane, during heavy rains, and livestock farming because the government has, a, has, a, has a, a policy of promoting agricultural production. And one of the things that the consequences is that there's been a tendency to say that agricultural developments don't necessarily need development control or planning approval. And it's important to note the linkage between the, the, the land-based activities and the consequences in the ocean because some of our coral reefs, for example, have been affected by sedimentation and nutrient pollution. We've had um, eutrophication and you know, a buildup of algae on some of our reefs. 
Now, some of the constraints. Finance has been a major one because in some cases, we need big ticket solutions in terms of municipal sewage systems. We need um, another one is weak or inadequate legislation and gaps in legislation because we have a number of agencies that are involved in, in or have some role to play in the management of marine pollution. And of course, a consequence of that is also limited enforcement and insufficient coordination among many, the many actors. But another critical one is a deficit of knowledge and awareness because for many people, nutrient pollution is an, is an invisible problem. They don't see it, it's not obvious to them. And of course, when you come from, a, from an island culture where the belief was that the sea would clean up itself, then people don't really worry. A lot of people don't really worry. They can see that, you know, like there's a solid waste problem on land, they'll see that, but in the ocean, they don't worry about it too much. So in terms of solutions, one of the critical things we need to do in St. Lucia is we need to amalgamate our efforts on marine pollution legislation. We've had, we have a, we've had some draft pollution legislation sitting there for a while, but we've signed on to more multilateral environment agreements in the last few years, and these have to be included. So we need to go back and review the entire suite of, of, of um, legal instruments and consolidate that. Then there's a need for improved liquid-based management in the capital. And I'm happy to say that the government, and the prime minister announced in his budget this year that we're going to, he's, we're going to start re port redevelopment and the wastewater management is going to be a critical priority for that. And um, expanding the municipal level and sub-development level wastewater treatment. In other words, we're moving, we want to move away from just the individual households to doing it on, on developing like housing sub-developments. Strengthening of interagency collaboration is another critical one, and new technologies and standards for domestic wage, um, sewage treatment. Reforestation is another one to help to reduce the, the effects of sedimentation, and establishing of standards for livestock, that's the planning standards for livestock rearing facilities, and of course, education and awareness. One mechanism that we have used is the land-based sources of Marine Pollution Protocol, that's the LBS Protocol to the Cartagena Convention on the Protection of the, of the Caribbean Sea, the wider Caribbean Sea. And St. Lucia ratified in 2008, it came into force in 2009, and we're using the, the, the convention as a basis for moving forward, and we've participated in a range of regional activities. Some of the, the steps we've taken to date, we've been looking at, as I mentioned, we've been looking at sewage systems and housing developments, um, we've done studies for the Castries and View. The Castries is the capital, and Viewfort is our second largest city. We've been looking at these, and we plan to implement them slowly. We've done an identification of hotspots. We've developed rec um, voluntary water quality standards, recreational water quality standards, and um, we've used some low-tech tools like this. So this picture you can see there is a sediment, is a sediment pond where we've, we, act, we use that in rural areas where there's no um, access to a main system. So we've used some of these to try to, to solve the problem. And some of the, the lessons we've learned, we can go smaller large scale, but there's scope for both. And um, there's also scope for innovation and we need to be flexible in our approach. And I think that is it. And you can see why St. Lucia is a hell of the West. Thanks. Thanks, Christy. Our solution speakers begin with, I mean, sorry. We'll now hear from uh, Carrie Neilfid, uh, Thomas, Executive Director of the Mosaic Company Foundation and Senior Manager for Social Responsibility for the Mosaic Company, the world's largest, largest phosphate and potash producer. There she manages partnerships that integrate corporate social responsibility, community investment, sustainable agriculture, global food security, and nutrient stewardship. Thank you, Carrie. I'm pleased to share with you today the concept of 4R nutrient stewardship, a framework that agricultural producers should use to keep nutrients in crop yields and minimize runoff into waterways. First, though, I want to do a little bit of a reset on the conversation. We've talked about a lot of problems, uh, but we also need to understand that the reasons are for these nutrients and the solutions to help. Everyone step back and think about the importance of feeding the world and doing it in a way that supports water resources. 
And the agriculture community is eager to partner with solutions and smart policy, but they cannot be pushed away. The language and divisiveness of the word pollution is not always welcoming, and welcoming agriculture, not working against it, will get better results and share ownership. And so when you're working with a farmer, don't use the word pollution. Uh, farmers care about water, and they don't want what they pay for, fertilizer, to end up in waterways, and nutrient stewardship is a solution. So to start, let's talk about global food security. When you look at this chart, you can see that agriculture has been winning against very big odds. By 2050, the world's agriculture must feed over 9 billion people, an increase of 2 billion. There will be increasing demands on our agricultural systems and produce um, that's going to be expected to come at a level of production that's never been seen. And we also, at the same time, have to protect our waterways. So why is food security so critical to understand when we're here at an oceans conference? As noted by the State Department and governments globally, that global food security is critical for regions to be able to maintain economic and political stability. When countries experience food insecurity, there is conflict and unrest. The same is true for marine environments. Leaders must consider this nexus of food and water security together instead of looking at them independently. So when you look here, you can see that today more people are being fed off of the same farmland as decades ago. With future food production, there will not be new acreage coming into production, but current farmlands need to be more productive. That is referred to as sustainable intensification. And fertilizer can help with this issue. With current food production, 40 to 60% of crop yields are attributed to fertilizer. And by 2050, the amount of food that needs to be produced additionally is 70% over what we're doing today. So you're used to seeing a periodic table and that morphs into this, that there are 17 essential plant nutrients. This is what plants eat. And they need a balanced diet of these nutrients to be healthy and to be productive and produce the yields that we need. And there's a science that goes to this, that plants need to consume naturally occurring nutrients that come from either organic or mineral sources. Whether it comes from manure or mineral sources shown above, all plants need to eat. The crop nutrition industry and the agriculture community have the 4-R nutrient stewardship framework as a solution. 4-R nutrient stewardship is fertilizer best management practices. The 4Rs are the right source, which is the formula of fertilizer needed. The right rate, which is how much fertilizer is applied. The right time, which is when the plant will eat. And the right place, which is where the fertilizer is applied for optimal uptake. The four rights are all necessary to increase production and farmer profitability while also enhancing the environmental protection. I want to highlight two innovative approaches that are going on right now. The Western Lake Erie Basin 4R Nutrient Stewardship Certification Program encourages agricultural retailers and other service providers to adopt proven best practices. In the lead are the Nature Conservancy and the Ohio Agribusiness Association working with agricultural retailers. This voluntary new program provides a recognized standard for ag retailers in Indiana, Ohio, and Michigan where surrounding waters drain into Lake Erie. And what it does is promote the sharing, research, and technologies that needs to happen in the region. Another example is Keep It for the Trop by 2025. In Illinois, focused on crop nutrients that are better utilized and at the same time making sure that water is protected, specifically for the Mississippi River watershed. KIC is supported by state agencies and led by a number of different organizations that you see here and has goals for reducing nutrient losses through the adoption of 4Rs. Two to three million dollars is raised annually from an assessment of 50 cents to three dollars per ton of fertilizer sold, and that is funding research in various watershed projects you can see in the map. In the U.S. between 1979 and 2000, the use of technologies helped to reduce fertilizer applications by 30 percent. Modern agriculture relies on science-based approaches. You can see the farmer on the right. That is called precision agriculture. GPS located fields, site-specific management, acres broken down by soil type, and four hours and variable rate of application of fertilizer. And you wouldn't believe it, but farmers can be techies. Also what you need to know though is that there are small holders like you see on the left and those small holders are working to raise food on less than a hectare of land and those farmers can apply fertilizer in a bottle cap to get the right rate and they can use a stick to be able to dig a hole for the right place. Research, best practices and sound policy decisions together provide solutions that can both feed our world and place environmental responsibility together because they need to be united when we're looking at our solutions. Thank you.
Thank you, Carrie. I'd like to thank our panelists for their excellent pre uh, presentations. And as we did in our last panel, we'll now be opening up the floor and the lines to our online audience. Again, if you wish to ask a question or make a comment, please raise your hand and someone will come to you with a microphone. And for those of you online, please post your questions via Twitter using the hashtag OurOcean2014. Uh, so any questions? Uh, the gentleman uh, in the, this side over here. Uh, David King, UK government. Um, one aspect of the pollution of the oceans that hasn't been mentioned is uh, the um, destination of human solid waste. And I just uh, wish to raise this to get some comment from the uh, excellent participation we've had from the panelists. Uh, if I just take New York City, uh, New Yorkers are producing about a billion grams of human solid waste every day. And that is treated and put into the oceans and we have seen the, the result in much of the data that's presented. The nitrates and phosphates that are included in that are about 1%. We fix nitrogen from the atmosphere to make nitrates. The net result of our process is that it ends up in the oceans. We mine phosphorus. The cost of both of these in terms of resources is massive. And I just wonder whether we shouldn't be mining human solid waste for the nitrates and phosphates, which are valuable products, and actually getting around to regulating the process at government level to see that we stop sending treated waste into the ocean. Do you want Go ahead. I'll go. Um, first of all, um, excellent points. The uh, human wastewater treatment is more of a problem in Long Island Sound than, say, perhaps the Mississippi River watershed, which is mostly agriculturally produced. So depending on your watershed and the sources and the activities, you would want to address nutrient solutions in different ways. Within the U.S., at least, there's tertiary treatment where nitrate levels exceed drinking water standards. And um, there's a big effort to put at least animal wastes uh, back onto the landscape as fertilizers, but um, the health concerns with human waste uh, do not allow that. Um, one of the things I think we have to begin to think about is green solutions. Um, right now, we're thinking of this as a waste and treating it as a waste. And as you mentioned, we need to treat it as a resource. And there's a big movement in the sewage treatment plant business to recover the phosphorus. And I think it's being shown to be economically feasible as well. But there are other things that sewage has in it too. You could actually produce uh, biogas uh, from a lot of the sewage as well. So I think we need to think about some of these sustainable solutions to try and extract resources from that waste instead of just treating it and sending it out to the sea. Okay, we have a question from the gentleman in the very back. Hello, I'm, I'm Bill Dewey with Taylor Shellfish Farms in Washington State. My question is for Daniel. I'm familiar with a, a, a project that was done in Lysicle, Sweden, where they uh, had an issue with nutrient, uh, nutrients from their sewage treatment plant, and they mitigated them by putting a mussel farm in the fjord there. And I, we're excited about that as a potential solution because you're using those nutrients to create a resource, create jobs, and they were very innovative in taking those mussels and producing poultry feed and composting it for terrestrial fertilizer. And I just think it's a, a wonderful, uh, you know, from a policy standpoint, a wonderful creative way to deal with a problem. Uh, and we've taken that example and tried to convey it to policymakers in the Pacific Northwest United States and had some success. We've got some pilot projects going, but I just wonder if you could speak to that as a potential solution to nutrient pollution. Yeah, there are a number of issues associated with this, and uh, we've looked into it for the Baltic Sea, and one of the problems is in the Baltic Sea, we have a very low salinity. It's somewhere uh, between five and eight parts per thousand. And it doesn't grow large muscles. Their muscles are the size of your thumb uh, nail. 
And so you really can't remove enough nutrients for it to matter in the Baltic Sea. When you get out of the Baltic Sea, up north where they were doing it in Sweden, it's much more viable to reduce nutrients or have the mussels take up chlorophyll. Um, we're, it still means that the nutrients are going into the water. We're growing algae and the mussels will then take up some portion of that algae. And I think it's much better to be used to take the nutrients out from the source before they ever reach the sea. And I think that's what we should focus on. It can be used as a mitigation tool, but many of the mussel farms, uh, and, and it depends on where you are, are put into shallow marine systems, and that mussel waste goes to the bottom and creates hypoxic conditions. And then you have other processes, such as phosphorus being released and dead zones underneath mussel farms. So as a solution, I don't know if it's necessarily really a long-term viable solution to remove nutrients from waters. Yeah, thanks. Uh, there's a question from the gentleman. Thank you. My name is Frederick Hauge from Bologna Foundation. And I, I like your comment, uh, Mr. Connolly, about uh, making green solutions. Because very often we see that this kind of pollution is resources at the wrong place. Mm -hmm. I'm working in Norway and we have a lot of fish farming with more local nutrition pollution challenges. And uh, we have now, together with one of the biggest fish farming companies, Lere, we have established a test facility for growing seaweed to take care of the nutrition from the fish farm. And I think that is a way to look at new marine bioproduction. Uh, bio, uh, bio if you look at the last IPCC report, it's obvious that we need to find new ways of using seawater to produce mm -hmm. biomass to bind CO2 for production of both mm -hmm. energy and food. And I think this nutrition pollution that we have many places around the world could be a fantastic new source of biomass production that we really need. We're doing this both in Norway, we're now building a test facility for this, both with mussels, uh, seaweed, upwelling technologies and so on, and the results are very, very interesting in what kind of yield we get per square meter, and we're using then the pollution as a resource. We are also doing the same thing in a project called the Sahara Forest Project in the desert, where we bring in seawater into the desert and in a combination of algae production, concentrated solar power, and a seawater greenhouse, are able to make use of the nutrition in the seawater uh, in a way that I think will be game-changing when it comes to the future production of biomass. But when you look at IPCC, they say now we need to go carbon negative. They say there is approximately 100 gigajoule of bioenergy from land mass, but we need a lot more to combat global warming. We find the solution in the seawater, and the first place we should look is where we have the nutrition as a pollution and where we can turn it into resources. Great. Thank you. I think we have a question at the back on this side. Thanks very much. Um, Malcolm Thompson from the Australian Government, the Department of Environment. I wanted to make a comment about um, the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, to put the, the reef in context uh, for people who may not know, the, the Great Barrier Reef along the Queensland coast in Australia um, uh, stretches around 2,300 kilometres. The, the marine park, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, is about the same size as Italy. So it's a massive estate to manage and, and presents many challenges. Uh, but um, there has been uh, a reef water quality protection plan in place for the reef uh, for a number of years now. It's a collaboration between the Australian Government and the Queensland Government. And there's uh, a report card was recently released uh, just Thursday of last week uh, by those governments on what progress we're making in uh, improving water quality in the reef. The three biggest uh, challenges for water quality for the reef are around nitrogen, um, sediment uh, and pesticides. The most recent report card has shown uh, continued improvement in reductions for both um, uh, sediment and pesticide, which are, are very pleasing. Also a reduction for nitrogen, but it continues to be a, a challenge for us. Um, the Australian Government is continu continuing to invest in water quality improvements for the reef. And the latest initiative, uh, our Reef Trust, is designed to, amongst other things, seek to, to get a step change improvement in water quality uh, runoff for the reef. Um, one of the initiatives that we are pursuing is around uh, market-based instruments 
including a, a reverse tender or an option to purchase nitrogen reductions from uh, cane growers and broadacre farming. I'd be interested in the panel's uh, comments on other market-based instru instruments that they see as being useful in achieving water quality improvements. Thanks. Okay. Does the panel have any comments on the market-based instruments? Mm -hmm. Do you want to say something? No, go okay. ahead. Um, I think it's a really good idea to use marketplace incentives. I, I, I think in the U.S., uh, most things are done on a voluntary basis, and uh, I think our experience shows that nutrients haven't been reduced enough. In, in Europe, um, we've been doing it mainly through legislation. Um, we have things called the nitrates directive and how much nitrogen can run off from fields. And we have things, it's also to protect groundwater resources. We have the sewage treatment directive. And we have a variety of different European directives that uh, basically legislate nutrient reductions. And that's certainly one way to do it. But I think that the marketplace solutions are kind of a happy medium between asking people to do it or voluntary and, and legislation. And that might be the way to at least initiate some of the reductions that we need. Okay. Yep. Is that the uh, Mayan? Yeah, there you are. Just, just mm -hmm. go. It'll... Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. All right. The, uh, the couple of examples that I gave earlier are market-based solutions that involve the entire agribusiness sector within those geographies. And that's important because people want to think that agriculture is the same all over the world and it's not. It really is very geographically focused and you need to create solutions that make sense for the soil type and the crops grown and the climate. Um, there are other solutions that are being explored in a few geographies. Um, there are water quality trading programs that are popping up. Uh, there's one, a big one, multi-state one that's existing in the Ohio River Basin. And there have been some smaller ones that have been tested. There are a number of reports that have been published on the efficacy of those programs. But it's one way to say that if farmers implement conservation agriculture practices, they can sell those credits so be able to use those funds to invest back into their property and make sure they're making changes in their operations. And on the same end, others can buy those credits to be able to offset um, any uh, needs that they have in industry. Okay, th thank you. Uh, the lady here in the front row. Um, I'm Laurie Garrett from the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. Um, this is kind of a general comment about the last two sessions. We opened up with the secretary painting a very grim picture of the state of the world's oceans and describing it in absolutely global terms. We've heard uh, 300 million tons of non-biodegradable waste will be in the oceans by 2030. All these dire forecasts, but the solutions being proffered, not to demean anybody's actions, but these are very small interventions compared to the global scale of what's been described. And I've not heard anybody talk about regulation, legislation, United Nations resolutions. It's all, can a little, one company do this? Can one group of children do that? Nice, but it's not gonna get rid of 300 million tons of non-biodegradable crap or stop the flow of fertilizers and the nutrification of our seas. I, I feel like there's a real mismatch between the scale of what was laid out in the morning and where we've ended up in the afternoon. I, I just, um, Dr. Connolly pointed out many ways that legislation and regulation has been implemented in Europe to address European-wide issues across boundaries, across, across water boundaries. I would challenge the U.S. to do the same thing. There's been a hypoxia task force to look at nutrient reductions in the Mississippi River watershed since 2001. And there has not been much progress because we are not using the R word, regulation. Wanting to do it in more cooperative ways and um, less punitive ways, but we, the US and the EPA and the Nonpoint Source and the Clean Water Act have enough teeth in them to make a difference, not to mention how we 
um, use U.S. dollars to subsidize agriculture instead of subsidizing perhaps conservation instead. Can I, yep. can I also add that the example that I gave in Illinois was, had a regulatory component to it. There was a law passed that said that for between somewhere between 50 cents and $3 on every ton of fertilizer sold, that money was going to be put into research and doing outreach projects to make changes. So your point is, why hasn't something happened faster? I think everybody recognizes that we're all a little behind uh, getting something moving. But what is important to recognize is that people are stepping up and they're wanting to see changes and they're recognizing that they need to do something. So that example in Illinois was regulatory related. And, okay, Kristen will add something too. Yeah, but if I can just make another comment. I think there is also a need to understand that countries and people can act more easily within the confines of their own national boundaries, their, their territorial sea, their exclusive economic zone. When you go into international waters, that is where there's a bigger problem because who has the, the jurisdiction necessary to go out into the international waters? It will require, yes, it will probably require international action to do this. But I, as you've heard, a lot, a lot of countries are still trying to grapple with the problem and dealing with it at the, at the national level. And so it, it'll take another step, I guess, to, to go you know, into, into the international waters to try to, to address it in a, in a comprehensive manner. Um, as someone from the United Nations, I'd just also like to add that uh, uh, UNEP and uh, sister agencies such as UNDP, UNESCO, IOC that's here today, we have been working on this problem. Um, it's the 40th anniversary of the regional seas. The Cartagena Convention mentioned by Crispin is, is one of our earlier conventions, and we have been working with 18 regional seas for the last 40 years to address this pro pro pollution problem. Um, we're now focusing on marine debris and uh, nutrients, and I'll also add that the Global Environment Facility that uh, I think is represented here today, too, is also contributing through a financing mechanism for uh, us to address uh, these issues on a large marine ecosystem, looking at it as a transboundary issue. As, Senator, as Secretary Kerry sta stated, there is no boundaries to this, and so we are working on it at different scales. But for action to take place in the short term, we certainly need these local sort of uh, small scale actions so that we can see what works and what doesn't work and then scale that up to a bigger one. And we are taking that approach in some of our projects and we are scaling up uh, certain areas such as our global uh, partnerships on nutrients and, and marine debris is just one example. Uh, okay, Sylvia? I wholeheartedly endorse the concept of scaling up <laughs> to try to match the solutions to the size of the problems. And I have a, a question for Dr. Robillet, specifically about your experience with, well, the growing number of, quotes dead zones. The number we heard this morning was like 500 that have come about in the last 50 years right. at a, an increasing rate. Your comments on on this, in nature, the natural system, there really is no such thing as waste. That when whales poop, they give nutrients back that drive the phytoplankton that cause the krill to prosper that feed the whales. And around and around the cycle goes. In the Gulf of Mexico, the natural cleanup crew, the oysters, the menhaden, the many creatures, the crabs and so on, that would glom on to the natural so-called, well, nutrients, waste, whatever you want to call them. Right. And it was basically working until we both overloaded the system on one side and destroyed the cleanup crew on the other. Not destroyed it, but greatly reduced its capacity to deal with the avalanche of new material not just in the Mississippi area. Chesapeake Bay is a classic example where, yeah. go back to the beginning, when my father was born, compared to today, the number of oysters, it's maybe 1%. Right. So you've really handicapped, you've crippled the natural system's capacity to deal with what we're now overloading from the land. So your thoughts, your comments okay. about what might be done 
for example, to grow oysters just to do their thing as oysters, not to eat them, but to do what oysters well, might naturally yeah. do, or menhaden, or right. the other creatures, to kind of leave them alone to do their job. Right. Well, one of the issues, Sylvia, is that the increase in nitrogen and phosphorus is an accelerating process. And the phytoplankton that blooms from that, the food web, is not structured the same way anymore to take care of all that excess phytoplankton, so it sinks to the bottom. One of the vicious circle issues in too much nitrogen and phosphorus and the low oxygen on the bottom is that the ecosystem functions on the bottom that would naturally remove nitrogen and phosphorus can't work anymore. And the organisms that live on the bottom can't live there anymore to take up and do their natural thing of processing sediments and, and just having a healthy ecosystem. So um, I'd like to, well, the, the whole system has shifted. Basically, the whole trophic system has, has shifted. And so to, really to get back to something where the natural system could work more, we do have to reduce the nutrients that are going into the ocean. There's just really no way around that. That's not a complete answer, I know, Sylvia. But. OK, the uh, timekeeper tells me you have uh, time for one more quick question. Does anybody want to pose a question? There's OK, Carol. I was wondering whether you'd like to comment about the feedback between ocean warming uh, through climate change and oxygenation of the water. Thank you. I'll take that one. Um, as the ocean gets warmer, less oxygen dissolves in that warmer water. So ocean-wide, there's a desaturation of oxygen because of warming water. The warming water in the coastal areas also creates a stronger, what's called stratification, which complicates and aggravates hypoxia as well. It can increase biological activity, which could, up to a point, maybe produce more organic matter that would sink to the bottom. So there are a lot of interactions just, just with climate acidification in the open ocean. The low oxygen waters and coastal waters are also acidic. So that's another form of acidification. It's, it's, um, it, you know, it's almost like the conference should have had one debris person, one nutrient person, one acidification person, one debris person, one, because they're all tied up in the same, this, this, all the same changes in, that's going on. Okay, Crispin? Just to add that when, when you have a situation where your, your marine ecosystems have already been weakened by, you know, by an overload of nutrients. They become less, less resilient. So when you add on another, another issue, such as um, another factor, such as, as ocean acidification, they, they're less robust, and as a consequence, they're likely to, to, to die off, you know, or be negatively, to be negatively impacted and have less of a problem to recover or to be able to, to, um, to adapt. Okay. Unfortunately, we have to cut it off now. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for your questions and comments during our discussion. During this panel, we heard how excess nutrients are entering into the marine environment and causing coastal and deep water, water quality problems, including dead zones and harmful algal blooms. We heard about the regional and local approaches that governments can take to implement solutions to problems related to nutrient pollution, including from wastewater and sewage. We also heard about innovative approaches to nutrient stewardship, including best management practices for agricultural producers to keep nutrients available for plant yields and at the same time minimize runoff into waterways that are linked to our oceans and that can lead to dead zones. We heard some examples of what needs to be done to solve the problem of nutrient pollution in the marine environment. We should again recall that the goal of this conference is to answer Sarah, Secretary Kerry's call to action to protect the oceans. We have heard during these marine pollution sessions that actions to protect the oceans often begin here on the land. 
I look forward to seeing how these discussions here today prompt action to clean up the marine environment and to prevent pollution of our oceans. This concludes the session on nutrient pollution. Thanks again to all of our marine po pollution panelists this afternoon, and I'd now like to welcome Ambassador David Balton to the stage. Thanks, Dave. Thank you very much, Jackie. Good afternoon to you all. For those of you who don't know me, I have uh, been working here at the Department of State for almost 29 years, and for the large majority of that time on issues related to our ocean. And I just have to say how gratifying it is to me to see all of you here today, those of you in this room, those watching online, those who have been tweeting. Thank you all for being here, for paying attention to this issue. I want to uh, add a further answer to the very good question about the scope of the problem and some of the solutions being presented. Part of our thought process in inviting the speakers we did invite to the conference today and tomorrow was to highlight some activities taking place in some parts of the world that do seem to be having some beneficial effect that can be replicated and adapted for use elsewhere that can be scaled up, at least potentially, because yes, we do have a disconnect between the size of the problems facing our ocean and the solutions available or at least put in place today. I have some housekeeping announcements, uh, four in particular. Uh, as we are concluding the first day of our conference, uh, please do not leave materials behind in this room. Please take everything with you. And in particular, please take your credentials. You'll need these to get in tomorrow. Third, about tomorrow, uh, the doors through which you entered uh, will uh, open uh, tomorrow at 8 a.m. Please plan to arrive sometime between 8 and 8.30. Um, we will be starting here promptly at 9 and there will be, among other things, a message from President Obama for you. And those of you who are conversant with social media, and even for those of you who, like me, are only recently conversant, please uh, spend the time this evening uh, continuing to contribute to the conversation online. Hashtag once again, Our Ocean 2014. Thank you all, to all the speakers, to everyone who's contributed to this conference so far. I look forward to seeing all of you again tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our conference for today. Please remember to bring your lanyard and credentials tomorrow. Our first session will begin at 9 a.m.